It's August 1946. The seemingly unremarkable man testifying at a war crimes tribunal in Tokyo is in fact no ordinary person. His story is one of the most remarkable in history. Aisin Joro Puyi was born in Beijing in February 1906. He's the nephew of the reigning Qing Dynasty Emperor of China, Guangxu. The Qings are Manchus from the northeast of China. They've been ruling the vast country since 1644. For nearly three years, Pu Yi lives quietly in this palace in Beijing. His father is the emperor's brother, Zai Feng. But dramatic events sweeping China are about to change little Pu Yi's life forever. Whilst industrial and political revolutions are spreading worldwide, China retains a feudal society that has existed for over 2,000 years. At the dawn of the 20th century, civil unrest and local conflicts between competing warlords are widespread. The times are ideal for major political upheaval. The Qing rulers remain isolated in their palace in Beijing the Forbidden City. For the Qings, the palace represents the very center of the civilized world. They'll only venture out to the Summer Palace, a tranquil retreat they've constructed for themselves nearby. Although Guangxu's emperor the real power is wielded by a remarkable woman, the emperor's aunt, Empress Dowager Tsu Shi. Now in her 70s, Tsu Shi has been at the imperial palaces since the age of 16 and has successively been an imperial concubine, then consort, and finally empress. Over the years, she's gained in power and influence until even Pu Yi's uncle, the emperor, kneels before her. Her technique is to dominate the reigning emperor from a very young age. First, her own six-year-old son, then Guangxu from the age of three. Now in his thirties, he's still childless, and Tsu Shi looks for a new boy emperor to manipulate. When Guangxu falls gravely ill with a mysterious ailment, Tsu Shi issues what will turn out to be her final decree. Two-year-old Pu Yi is to succeed as emperor and is summoned to her presence in the Forbidden City. Neither his father nor mother is allowed to accompany him. The little boy is terrified by the palace. He would later describe the scene. There was this eerie curtain before me, and behind it, an extremely ugly and thin face. The timing is extraordinary. 
Emperor Guangxu dies the very next day, aged 37. Almost unbelievably, Tzu Shi herself dies only 24 hours later. And just like that, tiny Pu Yi is suddenly Emperor of China. On the 2nd of December, 1908, Pu Yi is placed on the gold gilded throne as the 10th emperor of the Qing dynasty. Pu Yi is too young to understand the momentous events sweeping the country. Kuomintang party leader Sun Yat-sen is calling for a republic. For many, it's an opportunity to end the Manchu minority's feudal dominance. For decisions, the Qing court relies on Pu Yi's father, Zai Feng, acting as prince regent, and the previous emperor's widow, Empress Dowager Long Yu. When a rebellion spreads throughout China, they order it crushed, only to find their army no longer obeys its Manchu commander. They're forced to appoint popular general Yuan Sukai to resolve the crisis. He's a cunning and ambitious politician who quickly engineers Zaifang's resignation as regent. With Zaifang out of the way, Yuan bluntly informs Empress Longyu that the young emperor, Pu Yi, has no choice but to abdicate. In January 1912, the Republic of China is proclaimed, with Sun Yat-sen announced as its first president. A few days after Pu Yi's sixth birthday, a tearful Empress Longyu bows to the inevitable and places her seal on the act of abdication of the Qing Emperor. The terms agreed by the new republic are known as the Articles of Favorable Treatment of the Emperor. They allow Pu Yi to retain his imperial title and also a substantial allowance to maintain a court and household of eunuchs and servants. A few months after the abdication, a broken-hearted Empress Longyu dies, and Pu Yi's father, Zai Fang, returns to oversee the curious imperial court that now remains. Ten months later, Sun Yat-sen relinquishes the presidency to Yuan Sukai. On New Year's Day of 1913, Yuan stages his presidential investiture at the Forbidden City. With this, the great Qing Empire, which has ruled China for 268 years, is officially gone, marking the end of 2,132 years of feudal society. It's a huge moment in Chinese history. But for little Pu Yi, the story is far from over. Although officially deposed, Pu Yi is still addressed as emperor. The articles of favorable treatment allow him to remain in the Forbidden City, but don't specify for how long. In his pseudo-court at the palace, Pu Yi remains revered and is served by a small army of eunuchs and palace maids. His words are heavenly commands and his residence the Forbidden Chambers. Even the palace walls and the tiles on top of the roofs are strictly regulated. 
The system prevents normal relationships. So young Pu Yi is one of the loneliest boys in the world. It'll be years before even his brother will be allowed to join him. His only company, apart from the imperial family's women, is a veritable army of court eunuchs. These men are integral to China's feudal practices. Often born of poor families, they castrate themselves for a chance to enter into imperial service. The chief eunuch in charge of Pu Yi's daily life tells him stories that will exert an unconscious but far-reaching influence on him. He tells Pu Yi of a snow-capped mountain. Long ago, beautiful angels go there to bathe. One of them eats a red fruit picked by a magic bird and soon gives birth to a baby boy. The boy is Pu Yi's ancestor. The magic bird tells him that he is a son of the gods and the Aisin Juru family will be masters of the land. Pu Yi is also shown a dragon engraved in the imperial throne. In its mouth is clasped a glass stone. If the emperor on the throne is not appointed by the heavens, the dragon will spit out the stone and kill the false emperor. Through these fairy tales, the concept of divine appointment begins to take shape and crystallize in the young emperor's mind. But all this is about to be challenged. Winter 1915, and cheers of long live the king are heard just outside the forbidden city. From a high vantage, Pu Yi sees that the three main halls of the palace are undergoing a facelift. To his horror, he discovers that President Yuan Su Kai is offering sacrifices and declaring himself emperor. This is too much for supporters of the Republic. A number of provinces rebel and take up arms against Yuan. Instead of becoming emperor as planned, Yuan is forced to give up his monarchist ambitions and a few months later dies of physical and mental breakdown. Yuan's bizarre behavior is symptomatic of the turbulent times following the fall of the Qing dynasty. In the south, there is the Republic of China government. In the north, squabbling warlords. Ironically, these conflicts have little effect on the young emperor in the Forbidden City. In fact, the warlords are so busy fighting one another that most of them pay Pu Yi little attention. Across the planet, World War I is raging in Europe. By 1917, the Republic of China's president and premier are quarreling over China's allegiance in the cataclysmic conflict. On the pretext of mediating, a Qing general leads a 5,000-strong army and occupies Beijing. Once in control, he restores Pu Yi to his throne. Six years after his abdication, the news causes a huge outcry across China. A hastily assembled coalition of government and warlord forces quickly defeat the Qing general's heavily outnumbered troops.
In the end, 11-year-old Pu Yi is emperor again for only 12 days, before being forced to step down a second time. He survives the saga with nothing more than a fright, after which he keeps a low profile in his sanctuary at the Forbidden City. And finally, he's getting someone to play with. It's his younger brother, Pu Jie. Now 10 years old, Pu Jie is summoned to the palace to meet the emperor. He expects to meet an old man with a white beard wearing a crown. He's amazed to discover that the emperor is just a boy like himself and that he's his own brother. And there's another change in the offing. In 1919, a contract is signed with the British Embassy to provide a tutor for Puyi. Scotsman Reginald Johnston, later portrayed by actor Peter O'Toole in a feature film, has a master's degree from Oxford University in England. He speaks fluent Chinese and is a scholar of China's history and poetry. Over the next few years, he'll completely change Pu Yi's view of the world. Pu Yi's Chinese teachers have stressed philosophies of divine appointment and personal supremacy. But Johnston is not bound by Chinese traditions and introduces the boy emperor to Western technology and thinking. Puyi starts to realize there's an amazing world beyond the Forbidden City, one that he'd like to experience for himself. The court now decides it is high time Puyi got married. According to Qing custom, an emperor can have one wife and countless concubines. Suitable girls are groomed from a very young age. Pu Yi selects two of them. Wan Rong, born of a prominent and rich family, and Weng Shu, who is from a fallen noble house. On the 1st of December, 1922, the Qing royalty hold a grand wedding ceremony for Pu Yi at the Forbidden City. Wan Rong becomes empress and Weng Xu concubine. After the wedding, Pu Yi and his empress retire to the nuptial room in the palace of earthly tranquility. Everything is red, designed to excite sexual passions but things don't go according to plan. After we drank nuptial wine and ate auspicious cakes, we went into this dark red room. I felt suffocated. My bride was sitting by the bed with her head bowed. I watched her for a while, registering only the red of the screen, the bed sheets, her clothes, her cheeks. I felt really uncomfortable and restless. Preferring my own chambers, I walked out. In fact, Pu Yi's eunuchs had been bringing palace maids to sleep with him for some time. He is reported to have become bored and even disgusted by sex. Later, his rumored impotence will be blamed on this. Even when Pu Yi visits Wan Rong in her residence in the Hall of Abundant Beauty, it is only briefly. Of more interest is Wan Rong's younger brother, Ron Chi. Although Pu Yi is six years his senior, he likes to have him around to play with him and his brother Pu Ji. Johnston's influence inspires Pu Yi to challenge some time-honored Qing traditions. Long pigtails are the Manchu custom. 
Johnston calls the pigtail a pig's tail. Once he might have been hanged for such words, but Puyi is fine with a comment. In fact, he's starting to find his own pigtail irritating. And with Johnston's encouragement, he cuts it off. The pigtail was such a symbolic thing. How could the conservative people take it? The three grand imperial concubines were against it. So were the old timers. But Puyi went ahead and cut it. It was quite brave of him. When Pu Yi shows his short hair to the grand concubines, the elderly ladies burst into tears. But within a few days, the thousand odd men in the palace also have their pigtails cut off. And there's another major issue brewing in the palace. The Forbidden City is like a giant Aladdin's cave of assorted treasures. Some of them start to go missing, even pearls from the Empress's crown. Johnston and Puyi suspect the eunuchs. To cover their tracks, the eunuchs burn down the Hall of Cultivating Prosperity. An unknown number of rare and priceless treasures are destroyed in the fire. A furious Puyi decides to expel all the eunuchs. He directs his army to come to the palace and evict them. The whole expulsion process takes less than an hour. Out of a thousand eunuchs, only about a hundred are retained. This exercise of power emboldens Puyi to ask Johnston's help to venture beyond the Forbidden City. His plan? To go abroad to study. As it happens, Puyi is about to leave the palace, but not in a manner of his own liking or choosing. In 1924, a battle between rival warlords results in the arrest of the President of the Republic. The general responsible declares that there can be no peace as long as the last emperor of the Qing Empire remains in the Forbidden City. The articles of favorable treatment are abruptly amended. With immediate effect, the new document abolishes the emperorship and orders Pu Yi and the imperial household to leave the palace. With his army outnumbered, Pu Yi has no choice but to leave the Forbidden City, exposing him to the outside world for the first time since he was two. With the onset of winter, Pu Yi finds himself back at his father's palace. Since his shock eviction from the Forbidden City, he's been living in fear. He's at a crossroads. He can now either accept the situation or fight to regain his empire. Either way, he is scared. In desperation, he asks his teacher and mentor, Reginald Johnston, to lobby the British Embassy for a visa to go to England. But wary of upsetting the Chinese, they make a fateful decision to turn Puyi's request down. He turns instead to another foreign power. One of his advisors is friendly with the Japanese in Beijing and brokers a deal with them. They give Puyi and his entire entourage sanctuary at their embassy and also advise him he'll be safer out of Beijing.
Before taking their advice, Puyi makes a surreptitious last visit to the Forbidden City. Looking up at the imposing structure, he is moved to tears and vows to return someday as emperor. For the next 20 years, it'll be his life's obsession. Early in 1925, Puyi disguises himself and boards a train. His secret destination, the Japanese settlement at Tianjin, 130 kilometers southeast of Beijing. At the time, Tianjin is the second largest city next to Shanghai. There are a number of districts belonging to the British, French, Germans and Japanese. Like nations within a nation, these sectors have their own administration authorities, social clubs and churches. There are even cricket and golf clubs and other facilities like swimming pools and race courses that cater only for foreigners. Puyi, his family, eunuchs and servants, an entourage of 30-odd people, move into a building in the Japanese enclave. When word gets out, Qing officials from all over the country come to offer their services. And Puyi establishes another court. The long-term goal, to realize his dream of restoring the empire. Tianjin becomes a bizarre world of opportunists keen to use Puyi to revive their fortunes. And he meets with almost all of them. The Japanese are cultivating Puyi because he's still the symbolic head of the Manchus and their homeland of Manchuria, with its vast fertile farmlands and rich iron and coal resources. By 1927, the Japanese government is secretly recommending to their emperor that Manchuria be annexed from the rest of China by military force. In a notorious incident in 1928, their army assassinates one of the warlords Puyi has been dealing with by blowing up a train he is traveling on. The dead warlord had been warning Puyi against the Japanese. But this is all but forgotten a few weeks later when Kuomintang government forces ransack and loot the Qing royal tombs, desecrating bodies and stealing treasures. These are the graves of Puyi's own ancestors. He's outraged and vows to take revenge on the Kuomintang government and its new leader, Chiang Kai-shek. But for the time being, he has neither the power nor influence to carry out his threats. The assassination of one of their own now unites the northeastern warlords and brings them together under the flag of the Republic. This is a threat to Japanese plans in the region and it is now that Puyi will become really useful to them. In 1931, a secret army memo recommends forcible unification of the four northeastern provinces and Mongolia. It'll be a homeland for the Manchus and Mongols with Puyi as its nominal ruler. Within a week, the Japanese make their move. In a lightning strike, they take the major Manchurian city of Shenyang in a day, and in just over four months, a large part of northeastern China. For the Chinese people, it's to be the start of a 14-year-long nightmare.
Following the conquest of Manchuria, Japanese national fervor runs high. Under the banner of the Greater East Asia Holy War and to near hysterical adulation, their army continues its advance into Chinese territory. Faced with the invasion, the Chinese Kuomintang government appeals to the League of Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. It responds by forming an investigative committee made up of representatives from England, America, France, Germany and Italy. For Puyi, it's decision time. He wants to restore the Qing Empire and regain his throne. The Japanese want him to leave Tianjin to help establish a puppet state under their control in Manchuria. For the next decade, they'll play out a complex game of mutual benefit mixed with deep-seated mistrust. As Pu Yi considers his options, he is distracted by a domestic matter. Concubine Wang Xu disappears and a few days later files for divorce. In China's history, an emperor often abolished the empress or executed a concubine. But for a concubine to divorce the emperor was unheard of. Pu Yi is deeply insulted. The truth is that Weng Xu has never really been happy. Barely 14 years old when she was chosen as concubine, the luxuries of the palace could not make up for the loneliness and lack of family companionship. She once wrote that she likened herself to a little fawn imprisoned in a garden. Pu Yi hardly visited Wen Sui. He spent more time with Wan Rong. So when she was very lonely, like she was being ostracized. So when she filed for divorce, I felt it was very normal. Pu Yi has little choice but to agree to the divorce suit. To salvage some of his injured pride, he issues a decree demoting Weng Shu to the status of commoner. Meanwhile, to force his hand, the Japanese decide to frighten Pu Yi into leaving Tianjin. He gets death threats and even a bomb delivered in a fruit basket. Next, the Japanese hire 2,000 ex-soldiers and local gangsters to start a riot. In the ensuing panic, a number of people are killed and many wounded. Surrounded as he is by Japanese advisers, Pu Yi has no idea that they are behind the series of alarming events. Pu Yi was extremely naive. He would believe anyone. It was partly due to his background, being sent to the palace when he was only a few years old. The bottom line, Puyi was quite muddle-headed and couldn't tell a bad person when he met one. The Kuomintang government now makes a belated attempt to woo Puyi back, offering him money and a home in Shanghai. But it's too late. He reminds them of the desecration of his ancestors' tombs and refuses their advances. In November 1931, Pu Yi hides himself in the back of a car and secretly leaves Tianjin under cover of night. He boards a Japanese transport ship before transferring to a merchant vessel bound for Manchuria. He's decided to take his chances with the Japanese. Two days later, Puyi arrives at a small port on the Manchurian coast. In the chilling cold, there's no hero's welcome for him as he sets foot on his ancestor's native land. 
Only a few Japanese wait to receive him at the wharf. They take him to a town about a hundred kilometers south of Manchuria's capital, Shenyang. Here he stays at a hotel managed by a Japanese club. Soaking in a mineral-rich hot spring, Pu Yi's mood improves. Amidst the steam, he visualizes the majestic imperial palace at Shenyang and the throne from which he will gaze down on his subjects. His good mood quickly evaporates the next morning. When he decides to take a walk outside, Japanese police tell him he'll need the permission of their Colonel Itagaki. Pu Yi waits anxiously, but Itagaki doesn't arrive. Instead, the Japanese move him to Lushun, hundreds of kilometers to the south. He starts to wonder if he's been tricked. In fact, the Japanese are trying to decide how to proceed. Three months pass in Lushun, and there's still no visit from the Japanese Colonel Itagaki. Pu Yi considers returning to Tianjin and writes to Itagaki giving 12 reasons why it is imperative that he become emperor, otherwise he'll leave. At this time, I did not care how many Manchurian people died, how the Japanese would rule this settlement, how many soldiers they would station here, what ore they were mining. What I cared about was regaining my throne. I wanted them to recognize me as emperor. If not for this, why would I have come all this way? If I wasn't going to be emperor, my existence would be pointless. While Pu Yi cools his heels in Lushun, the Japanese set up a committee to decide on the details of the proposed new state. In mid-February 1932, the committee holds a nation-building conference. There are two main factions, one arguing for a monarchy with Pu Yi as emperor, and the other for a state with Pu Yi as president. The two sides can't agree, and finally the issue is decided by the Japanese. The committee emerges to issue a declaration of independence, announcing Manchuria's separation from China. Now, at last, Itagaki goes to meet with Pu Yi. He tells him that the Japanese want to build a nation called Manchukuo. This nation would include five major tribes, the Manchu, Han, Mongols, Japanese, and Koreans. He shows Pu Yi the flag of the new Manchukuo and a pre-prepared declaration of the people of Manchukuo. He informs him that the committee has voted for Pu Yi to be the new nation's leader. He'll be its head of state. But Pu Yi isn't happy. What about the Qing Empire and his emperorship? Itagaki assures him that in due course, a law will be passed to restore the monarchy. His role as head of state will just be temporary. Furthermore, if Pu Yi does not accept their terms, they will deem him hostile and treat him as an enemy. It's an ultimatum, and Pu Yi realizes he has no choice. Reluctantly, he accepts the offer. In March 1932, 
Pu Yi leaves Lushun and journeys to Manchukuo's new capital, Changchun. The two million square kilometers of land and three million people of Manchuria are inconsequential to him compared to the title of emperor. He's bitterly disappointed, but at least it's a start. The welcome he receives at Changchun goes some way to restoring his flagging morale. Behind the scenes, the Japanese have ensured a good turnout. Puyi's investiture is held at a government office. Though it's a far cry from the splendor of the Forbidden City, the grandiose ceremony makes Puyi more comfortable with his decision to side with the Japanese. After Puyi takes office as head of state of Manchukuo, he converts this Russian-style building into his imperial palace and legislative office. According to the Manchukuo constitution, as head of state, he's executive ruler. In theory, he can exercise legislative, administrative, and jurisdictional authority appoint government officials, and command the army, navy, and air forces. But Puyi quickly discovers that the real power rests with the Hall of General Affairs, which is directly controlled and staffed by the Japanese army. Puyi, the head of state, is just a figurehead. 24 years later, Puyi testifies at a special court martial. Soon after the establishment of Manchukuo, the Japanese government implements a huge migration scheme. According to the plan, Japan will ship one million households to Manchuria over a period of 20 years. It declares, to massively migrate to Manchuria is in line with the needs of the political development of the Japanese empire. It is part of the state-run enterprise to fully make use of the land in Manchuria. What is not mentioned is the hundreds of thousands of Manchurians who are to be dispossessed by the new arrivals. Despite continuing Japanese encroachment on Chinese territory, Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang government are distracted by their obsession to defeat the growing power of a new threat that has been gaining in strength since 1921. The Chinese Communist Party, under the leadership of Mao Zedong. 
In 1931, the Kuomintang sign a ceasefire agreement with the Japanese army and declare several provinces non-military zones. The following year, the League of Nations Committee arrives in Manchuria and meets with Pu Yi and the Japanese at Changchun. Later, British representative Lord Lytton announces their findings. The Japanese occupation of this large part of China was not justified on the ground of self-defense and that the new state which had been set up was a Japanese protectorate rather than a genuine case of Manchurian self-determination. The League proposes an international intervention plan for Manchuria. Japan's ambassador addresses the delegates to voice his government's vehement opposition. It is a matter of common knowledge that Japan's policy is fundamentally inspired by a genuine desire to guarantee peace in the Far East and to contribute to the maintenance of peace throughout the world. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. The Japanese delegation storms out and gives notice of its country's withdrawal from the League of Nations. Qing supporters seize the moment to mount a campaign for restoration of the monarchy. I dreamed my emperor dreams again. I was very concerned about news from various fronts. I put my hopes in the Japanese army, even though they were massacring my Chinese people. When they occupied a large area, I threw a big banquet for them. I congratulated all the soldiers who took part in the battles. I wished them continuing good luck on greater endeavors. Later, a troop of Japanese soldiers were only a hundred miles from Beijing, but did not advance further which was a big disappointment for me. To bolster the legitimacy of their actions in China, the Japanese now decide to upgrade Puyi's international profile. In October 1933, they inform him that the Japanese government will now recognize him as emperor. Puyi is elated. The day that he has hoped for for years has finally come. The first thing he thinks of is what he'll wear. Previous Emperor Guangxu's ceremonial robes have been kept, but the Japanese tell Pu Yi he's only Emperor of Manchukuo, so he can't wear the Qing robes. He must wear a military uniform they've designed. After a heated argument, they compromise. At dawn on the 1st of March, 1934, Pu Yi celebrates his coronation in full Qing regalia. After the ritual, Pu Yi emerges wearing the uniform designated by the Japanese army. So finally, after a roller coaster ride of events and emotions, Pu Yi realizes his dream. For the third time in his life, he's an emperor. And he's only just turned 28. A new chapter is about to start in Pu Yi's extraordinary life one that he hopes will see him restored as emperor of all China. As it will turn out, however, he started down a path that will take him on a journey far stranger than he could ever imagine. In April 1935, 
Puyi makes his first trip outside China, but not to England as he had once hoped. Boarding a battleship, he heads for Japan. He still wants to be emperor of the whole of China and is relying on the Japanese to deliver it to him. He plays a role of mutual respect, even saluting Mount Fuji as he passes it. In return, the Japanese treat him with great pomp and ceremony, parading their military might in force. The trip culminates with the ultimate honor, meeting Japan's Emperor Hirohito. Together, they inspect troops and visit shrines. After all his ups and downs, Pu Yi is understandably moved by his treatment in Japan. He feels like he is finally nearing his goal of restoring the Qing dynasty. On returning to Manchukuo, he declares, I am one in spirit with His Majesty of Japan. All my people should also share my spirit and be united with our ally in heart and mind. Puyi's Japanese allies now start to run into increasing resistance against their incursions into Chinese territory. They retaliate by enforcing draconian classification and assimilation policies, displacing Chinese villagers and looting their homes. Large numbers of civilians are brutally massacred and a network of concentration camps constructed. Whilst Pu Yi plays out his role as a puppet emperor from his palace in Changchun, within its walls, his personal life has been disintegrating. His principal wife, Wan Rong, empress since their marriage in 1922, has long felt neglected by him, both physically and emotionally. Bored and lonely, she has increasingly turned to smoking opium to escape her world. As time goes on, this becomes a serious addiction. By now, her eyes are hurt by normal light and walking an effort. Pu Yi has been turning a blind eye to her habit, but when she has an affair with her personal servant and falls pregnant, he's furious. Some say that he has the resulting baby girl burnt in the kitchen stoves at birth, others that the infant dies from an illness. Whatever the truth, from now on Pu Yi virtually ignores his empress. Possibly to punish one wrong, Pu Yi takes another concubine, or necessary decoration, as he would sometimes refer to his wives. But this one is different. Pu Yi actually loves 17-year-old Tan Yuling. She's the nearest he'll come to finding a soulmate throughout his life. A well-educated girl from Manchu nobility Yuling is quite progressive for the times, and also outraged by what the Japanese are doing in China. She starts to quietly influence Pu Yi against them. In a devious move, the Japanese now orchestrate a marriage between Pu Yi's brother, Pu Jie, and Lady Hiro Saga, a relative of Emperor Hirohito. Because of his reputed impotence, or just infertility, the Japanese suspect Pu Yi'll never have children. 
So any sons resulting from his brother's marriage will be half Japanese and heirs to the throne of Manchukuo. Although he knows his brother actually loves his new wife, Puyi is unsettled When he hears Lady Hiro is pregnant, he becomes even more agitated. When Pu Jie was to become a father, I anxiously went to a fortune teller. I was even worried for my brother. They wanted an emperor of Japanese descent, so both my brother and I were likely to be sacrificed. I breathed a sigh of relief when I heard he had a daughter instead. Japanese now mount a full-scale invasion of China, and Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang government reluctantly decide to cooperate with Mao Zedong's communist forces to repel the invaders. Pu Yi finds himself in the increasingly uncomfortable position of having to support a foreign power against his own people people that he wants to rule once more. But he has burnt his bridges with the Kuomintang and can't possibly support the communists. Continuing on his fateful course, he exhorts the Manchukuo people to support the war effort of their ally, Japan. Even setting a personal example by donating gold and jewelry and stripping metal from his palace. Manchukuo now becomes a huge staging post for Japan's full assault on China. Its resources powering a massive military buildup. When dealing with documents submitted by the Japanese army, Puyi simply approves everything, barely bothering to read them. In fact, he's often signing laws that condemn his people to virtual slavery. Tens of thousands die from the forced labor and are unceremoniously dumped into mass graves. As their relentless advance continues, the Japanese now make a mistake that will change the course of the war and seal Puyi's fate. In December 1941, they launch a surprise attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. Puyi's growing unease about his Japanese masters is heightened when his favorite wife, Tan Yuling, dies suddenly aged only 22 whilst being treated by a Japanese doctor. He believes they have murdered her because of her anti-Japanese sentiments. The evidence is unclear, but her loss is a devastating blow. For years, he keeps a photograph of her in his wallet, written on the back, My Most Beloved Yuling. Following Yuling's death, the Japanese tried to interest Pu Yi in taking a Japanese wife, but he suspects she'd be a spy, and after a year of mourning, selects Li Yu Chin, a young Chinese schoolgirl. I was 15, studying at a girls' school. They told me I was picked to enter the palace to study. I didn't have to pay and might even get a reward. 
My parents were afraid it was a scam and were unwilling, but they couldn't defy the orders. So I left home, carrying only my school bag. A month later, Pu Yi makes Li Yuqin an imperial consort. By early 1945, the war is going badly for the Japanese. For the first time, the people of the Manchukuo capital Changchun are ordered to conduct air raid drills. Pu Yi now lives out his puppet emperor role in a daze. Increasingly anxious about the Japanese chances in the war and his own fate as emperor and he's right to be worried. In February 1945, at Yalta on the Black Sea coast, Soviet Premier Stalin, US President Roosevelt, and British Prime Minister Churchill are meeting to decide the world's fate. They agree that once the war in Europe is won, the Soviet Union will join the war against the Japanese. Pu Yi now spends his days glued to the radio. What he hears agitates him even more. By April, the Soviets have launched a massive assault on his notional ally Germany's capital, Berlin. On the 28th, he's horrified by the grisly circumstances of the death of the Italian leader, Mussolini. Two days later, he hears that Adolf Hitler has committed suicide. Soon afterwards, the Soviets take Berlin and Pu Yi realizes that it may only be a matter of time for the Japanese. On the 6th and 9th of August, the Americans drop atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the same time, Mao Zedong announces the final war on the Japanese invaders. For Pu Yi and his entourage, the writing is now clearly on the wall. On August the 9th, the Japanese inform Pu Yi that the Soviet Union has declared war on them. he'll have to move from the palace to an underground stronghold they've constructed in the mountains. They warn him that if the Soviets capture him, he's sure to be beheaded. They give him three days to pack up his treasures. These include historic and irreplaceable works of Chinese art. As well as packing treasures, Pu Yi orders the burning of documents and films, anything that might connect him with the Japanese. Pu Yi was really afraid. This was incriminating evidence. People would find out how he had worked with and served the Japanese. He gave orders to burn the film, Present-day film does not burn, but in the past it was celluloid and highly flammable. I burned them at the stoves in the basement of Puyi's house. To the frightening sound of air raid sirens, on the night of August the 11th, 
Pu Yi and his family make a panicked departure. They travel by train towards the underground stronghold, only to be diverted by the Japanese. The so-called stronghold is no longer safe. Eventually, they arrive in a small and deserted mining camp. It's the rainy season and there is no radio, no newspaper. They're totally cut off. It's now the 13th of August. Two days later, Emperor Hirohito of Japan informs his people of their unconditional surrender. With the news of the surrender, Puyi realizes that once again his time as an emperor is up. Just after midnight on the 17th of August, in a warehouse in the mining camp, before a few loyal officials and officers of the Japanese army, Pu Yi reads his resignation declaration, abdicating for the third time in his life. The Japanese tell him they'll move him to Japan by plane. Quickly packing his most prized treasures, Pu Yi selects a few men to come with him and leaves in the afternoon. A Soviet propaganda reenactment starring Pu Yi himself tells what happens next. On landing at Shenyang Airport, Pu Yi is arrested by the Soviet army. Many believe he is delivered to them by the Japanese as part of a peace deal, but there is no hard evidence one way or the other. On the afternoon of the 19th of August, 1945, Pu Yi boards a Soviet transport to fly into captivity and an uncertain fate. As Pu Yi flies into the unknown, Empress Wan Rong and the other women and children have been left to fend for themselves. Traveling on foot, they're soon intercepted by bandits. They had to unbraid their hair. First to go was the second mother. Something fell. A more stringent search was conducted. They went inside, where she stripped down to her underblouse and shorts. They searched through the clothes, ignoring cash, and took only jewelry and valuable items. Empress Wan Rong is eventually arrested and taken to a jail. Cut off from her opium supply, she descends into a nightmare world of withdrawal and despair. At the age of only 40, the last Empress of China dies in prison and is buried in an unmarked grave on a hillside. While the Chinese people celebrate the defeat of Japan, Pu Yi is arriving in the Soviet Union as a prisoner. He and the nine men in his entourage are brought to the southern Siberian town of Chita. They are detained in a relatively comfortable former Soviet army officer's sanatorium. Security is tight but Pu Yi and the others soon realize they are going to be treated very well in the circumstances. Every day, we had three sumptuous meals and a Russian-style afternoon tea. 
there were service personnel, doctors and nurses to conduct health checks and also a radio, books, newspapers and various kinds of recreation equipment. There were people who took us on walks. I immediately felt satisfied with this kind of life. They are soon joined by some other high-ranking members of the Manchukuo regime. The Cheetah Sanatorium now becomes overcrowded, and Puyi's group is moved to a villa in Khabarovsk, a town close to the Chinese border, just to the northeast of Manchuria. Here, life is equally good for Puyi. His Russian guards even get him a set of Chinese shell and marble furniture. To pass the time, Pu Yi begins to read about the Soviet system. He can't understand communism at all. He confuses Bolsheviks with an aristocracy. He's bewildered by the revolution and execution of the Tsar. When told there's never been a Bolshevik emperor, he naively wonders if he can be the first. Meanwhile, from January 1946, the powers that had forced the Japanese surrender commence a military tribunal in Tokyo to try alleged war criminals. The court makes a special request for Pu Yi to appear as a witness. After consulting with the Chinese, the Russians agree, and in August 1946, Pu Yi leaves the camp with his Soviet escort for the trip to Japan. The ex-emperor of Manchukuo is an important witness for the prosecution. He can establish the guilt of a number of Japanese accused of war crimes and testifies for seven days straight, the longest of any witness during the tribunal. His testimony attracts widespread media interest and packs out the courthouse. Uh, I became quite emotional on several occasions. When it came to Tan Yuling's death, I testified as if my own suspicions were confirmed facts and spoke with grief and anger, even saying she was murdered by the Japanese. No doubt, I was very emotional, but I also wanted everybody to regard me as a victim of persecution. Pu Yi walks a fine line at the tribunal. He's accused of being a criminal himself on more than one occasion. He later admits that he lies on a number of occasions about his involvement with the Japanese and that his testimony could have been much more damning but only at a risk to himself. The Kuomintang Chinese government asked the Soviets to extradite Pu Yi to them when he's finished at the tribunal, but they're backing Mao Zedong's communists, so refuse the request and return him to Russia. In China itself, Mao's forces are starting to make serious inroads in their bloody military struggle with the Kuomintang, starting to adopt an offensive rather than defensive strategy. Following Japan's surrender, 
Chiang Kai-shek had expected to defeat Mao and the communists within a year. But after two years and a series of reverses, he's starting to realize that there's a very real possibility that he'll end up the loser in the protracted civil war. Things go from bad to worse for the Kuomintang forces, whilst Mao's communists receive a hero's welcome as they take over more and more major strategic centers. Pu Yi is now increasingly worried about being sent back to China. On his capture, the Russians had let him keep his suitcase full of treasures, some of which he now offers to help the Soviet people. He also writes to Stalin, asking if he can stay in the Soviet Union permanently, but receives no answer. His growing fears are heightened when the communist forces finally triumph in mainland China whilst Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang followers flee en masse to the island of Taiwan. On the 1st of October, 1949, the People's Republic of China is officially founded. Early in 1950, Mao Zedong and Premier Zhou Enlai visit the Soviet Union. In their meetings with its leader Stalin, they ask for the extradition of Japanese and Manchukuo war criminals. As a gesture of friendship, Stalin agrees, and Pu Yi and the others are put on a train back to China. This is what Pu Yi has been dreading for years. All he can think of is that each new dynasty executes its predecessor. He's sure he's going to die. After a three-day journey, Pu Yi reaches the town of Fushun, close to Shenyang. Ironically, it's the very birthplace of his ancestors' Qing dynasty. Pu Yi and the others are taken to a prison, constructed during the Japanese occupation. It's officially designated a re-education camp. On entering, the once revered Emperor of China becomes just a number. Detainee 981. At first, he can't cope. He's never, even in Russia, had to do mundane chores himself. In the outside world, the Korean War breaks out. In September 1950, the American-led United Nations forces are threatening to overrun the communist North Koreans, 
and the Chinese People's Army crosses the border to aid their allies. Fushun is not that far away, and the prisoners are moved to a camp further inland. Here, the daily routine involves constant reading and rereading of communist texts and histories. Pu Yi now attempts to curry favor with the authorities by offering his priceless imperial seals to help support the war effort. He's first amazed and then deeply moved when the camp boss tells him that he also has the things he gave away in the Soviet Union. He explains that for the people, the person himself is more important, especially if re-educated. It's a turning point for Puyi. Up until now, he has merely been thinking of his own survival. He remains in the second camp for two years. In the process, he gradually becomes fitter than he has been since he was a child. When the Korean War grinds to a stalemate ceasefire in 1954, Pu Yi and the others are moved back to the original camp at Fushun. And now the process of re-education begins in earnest. A committee arrives at the camp to interrogate the inmates ahead of possible trials. It's a scary time, but the interrogations are not aggressive. Puyi's real problems come from the confessions of his own family and advisors. All expose his complicity with the Japanese. In August 1955, the committee shows Puyi the results of their investigation of him, listing several major crimes. Conspiring with the Japanese to revive the feudal rule of the Qing dynasty, signing a treasonous treaty with the enemy, willingly complying to Japanese wishes and endorsing policies and laws endangering lives, participating in anti-communist agreements, supporting the war of aggression, and finally destroying evidence and attempting to abscond to Japan. Devastated, Puyi writes a detailed confession. As the emperor of Manchu court and Japan's compliant traitor, I brought hell upon the people. Because I was a co-conspirator in robbing Manchuria of its resources, manpower and riches in support of the Japanese imperialist invasion, I brought an historic disaster upon the people of China and Asia. Ironically, Puyi's fate is in the hands of Mao Zedong, who starts his revolutionary journey at 18 in the very year that Puyi first abdicates. Mao's first essay is Karl Marx and Puyi. In it, he wrote, once a person has been an emperor, he will always want to be an emperor again. But in 1956, Mao declares that although Pu Yi and others have committed serious crimes, it makes no sense to execute them. It is far more useful to re-educate them to serve the people. Later that year, Pu Yi's fourth wife, Li Yuqin, comes to the camp. She wants a divorce.
The camp management is against it, thinking it might upset Puyi's re-education process. It is considered so important that the authorities set up a special room and allow Pu Yi and Li Yuqin a night together to work things out. But it doesn't help, and Pu Yi signs the divorce papers. He is now single for the first time since he was 16. Another of the prisoners' re-education tasks is to write up their life stories. Over a period of three years, and with the help of Brother Pu Jie and other court officials, Pu Yi compiles a 450,000-word historical account. In September 1959, Mao unexpectedly proposes a general amnesty for the war criminals. A few days later, the People's Congress passes the motion. When the deputy director of the camp tells him of the possible amnesty, Puyi doesn't believe it will include him. His crimes are too great. On the 4th of December 1959, the prisoners are assembled and the amnesty names read out. Pu Yi's is one of the first. He's not expecting it and can't believe it. Brother Pu Jie has to nudge him before he reacts. Finally, the emotion of the moment overwhelms him. After 10 years of re-education from a reactionary feudal emperor, I have become a common laborer. From a ghost, I have become human. The old Puyi has died, and today, a new Puyi is reborn. Five days later, Puyi arrives at Beijing Station, a free man, and is met by his sister. His new life is about to begin. Living with his sister, Pu Yi now becomes an ordinary citizen. even voting for the first time in his life. Pu Yi's neighbors treat him kindly, referring to him as Old Pu. Often, he's disoriented and can't find his way home. He's getting used to a completely alien world. Uncle frequently come to visit us. Sometimes he collected his money and he would lose it immediately. Finally, he tied a large wallet firmly to the back of his trousers. However, he was still prone to losing things. After a while, Pu Yi moves from his sisters into a hotel arranged by the authorities. He starts taking nostalgic walks, especially around Tiananmen Square and the Forbidden City, now known as the Palace Museum. During the Chinese New Year celebrations of 1960, Pu Yi unexpectedly gets an invitation to a private meeting with Premier Zhou Enlai.
It was the first time I went with Puyi to meet Prime Minister Zhou. Prime Minister Zhou asked him what he would like to do. He said he wanted to be a doctor. The Prime Minister was amused. In the past, you willfully changed prescriptions. If you were a doctor, you would probably kill someone. He suggested Pu Yi do some writing work, like uh, writing about his life. This could be a lesson for the future generation, making it a work that benefits society. Zhou suggests that Pu Yi work part-time at the Beijing Botanical Gardens. Later, they'll find him something else. Mao Zedong himself also asks to meet with Pu Yi. He suggests that he should marry again, joking that after all, an emperor cannot be without a consort. Pu Yi isn't so sure. Most of his marriages have been unsatisfactory in one way or another. His work colleagues, however, like the idea and one shows him a picture of a nurse named Li Shushan. Pu Yi agrees to meet Shushan, and they fall in love. They take to going out to movies and tranquil locations around Beijing. In April 1962, Pu Yi marries for the fifth and final time. His wedding speech reveals just how far he has come since his days as an emperor. In the past half of my life, I had always been served and reliant on others. Today, in the latter half of my life, I am proud, self-reliant worker. Puyi of the past only thought of himself. This Puyi has gone. He has died. I now build my small family among this big one of 650 million people of all nationalities. I am very happy and very encouraged. Mao had also suggested that Pu Yi should write about his life experiences. It turns out he has read the life story from Fu Xun, but thinks it's a bit on the heavy side. Zhou Enlai also gets involved and sends it to the Beijing People's Publishing House. After working with editors, Pu Yi's book, The First Half of My Life, is published. It creates a sensation in China and also abroad, where it is translated into several languages. Pu Yi and Li Shushan now have a good life. Comfortable at home together or attending social functions and receptions for visitors. At other times, they go visiting Pu Yi's brother and sister at their homes. Pu Yi's never really been happier. As an indication of the extent of Pu Yi's political rehabilitation, Mao and Zhou now arrange for him to be elected onto a prestigious national committee. Being on the committee gives Pu Yi the chance to travel the country and witness some of the rapid development taking place.
What Puyi treasures most is his newfound freedom. I was the number one prisoner of my palaces. Today, I enjoy real freedom and equality. I can go anywhere, something I never dreamt possible in the first 50 years of my life. Just as he is starting to feel relatively comfortable, Pu Yi comes under renewed threat on two fronts. His health has started to deteriorate significantly. And he's also victimized by a tumultuous movement known as the Cultural Revolution. As a former emperor turned war criminal, he becomes a target for the zealotry of the revolution's Red Guards. One of the Red Guard's tactics is to publicly shame their victims. Pu Yi escapes public humiliation, but his salary and food rations are cut, the royalties from his book denied him, and even some of his furniture removed. To add to the stress, he is diagnosed with bladder and then kidney cancers. He undergoes a succession of operations, becoming progressively weaker. In his 61 years, Pu Yi has gone from godlike emperor to political puppet, then a pampered prisoner in a foreign land followed by life in a re-education camp as just a nameless number. From the ashes of his former glory, he finally emerges to find some kind of peace with himself and the bizarre world that has shaped him. In early October 1967, Pu Yi is admitted to the Beijing People's Hospital for the last time. At dawn on the 17th of October, the last emperor of China's extraordinary life finally comes to an end. Twenty-eight years on from his death, Pu Yi's wife Li Shuxian brings his ashes from Beijing and reburies them near the tomb of his Qing predecessor, the Emperor Guangxu. There is no epitaph on Pui's tomb, just his name and the years of his life. <laughs>